The second Sunday of Advent reading is from John chapter 1. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was done, he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews at Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Christ. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Finally they said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Jesus replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Jesus is the Christ, period. This is the testimony of John the Baptist. For all the greatness of John the Baptist, for all the wisdom, powerful work, and changed lives. John is clear. Don't, don't confuse me with the one who is much greater than I, Jesus Christ. Like John, we who believe are to live our lives so that, we do, that all we do will point others to Christ. For as John says, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you give us the insight to follow the example of John the Baptist and the place the place you before all other in our life. May the power of your Holy Spirit be with us now. Amen. Our first lesson comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verses 16 through 20. How much better to get wisdom than gold, to choose understanding rather than silver. The highway of the upright avoids the evil. He who guards his way guards his life. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Our second lesson comes from the book of Matthew, uh, in chapter 4, beginning with verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been, uh, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in. Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness, have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. We will skip forward to verse 23. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all, all over Syria, and people brought to him brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain the demon-possessed, and those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Lar large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. 
And that ends our scripture reading. I wasn't really going to talk about this today, but it just seems fitting. You know, it seems 360 some odd days later, I'm standing here. And I don't know how many of you remember the first day that I stood here as your interim pastor and how I tried to hide behind this pulpit in fear. Um, You know, I I can honestly say it's it's been such an honor, and I know I've kind of overdone that with the the Chronicle and other avenues through Facebook, but I really want to say how much I do appreciate each and every one of you and this year that we've been through. Um, I can still tell you that I still have fear when I get up here. If I didn't, then you might need to question me. So it's it's a very... um, a powerful place to be whenever you have to discern God's Word and uh, deliver it to such wonderful people. So I want to say thank you for this year, and I look forward to many more. Um, The conclusion of last week's sermon also brought us to the midway point of the series, the Understanding Discipleship series. And before I introduce the third portion of the series, let's quickly review the first two portions. I don't know how many of you can remember back to the first portion. Uh, I think we were in shorts and uh, short sleeve shirts. It was probably June when we started that, where we set out to understand the mission that Christ Jesus gave to all of his disciples. And in order to understand this mission, we broke down the Great Commission in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. We learned how all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to Jesus. We also learn that those who are made new in Christ are restored by Christ through the grace and mercy of God, through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, through His resurrection, through the divine work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of an unrepentant sinner. They have been given, given authority from Christ Jesus to preach the gospel to all nations, to baptize those who identify with Christ, and to teach and to train up disciples. And even though working in this mission will be very difficult and will be very uncomfortable, we should do it anyway, because Christ assures us that He is always with us, even until the end of the age. The second portion we looked at, we looked at the cost of being a disciple in Christ, and we did this from two different scriptures. The first block of scripture that we went through was Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35, which number one showed us that we must be willing to put our relationship with Christ Jesus before all other relationships, including ourselves, and especially those who we love the most, which sometimes is ourselves. Sad thing. Number two, it shows us that we must be willing to pick up our cross, bear the weight of that cross, and to follow Jesus in His footsteps. Number three, it showed us the importance of assessing the cost of being a disciple of Christ before we make that decision to put our feet to the ground and to back up what our mouth professes. It also showed us that disciples of Christ must have purpose in their mission. And this mission and this purpose is only given to us by Christ Jesus. The second block, our second block of scripture that we looked at was Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, and most of you would know what I'm about to tell you. That block of scripture revealed our final cost, that loyal disciples of Christ Jesus are in fact strangers to the world, and as strangers to the world, we must be willing to step off of that fence of comfort and safety in order to step out into a world of discomfort, of suffering. Strangers to the world will stand up for Christ Jesus and stand up for the gospel. And because of this, they will stick out like a sore thumb. They will endure the suffering and persecution. And because of these facts, disciples of Jesus Christ must put Christ Jesus as their top priority before what our culture tells us is okay or what the traditions of the day tell us to think or how to act. Because of this, we must fully commit to Jesus Christ and to the mission He gives us. If not, we will be unable to keep our hand on that plow. 
as aspects of our former way of living will still entice us or make us look back or appear greener than it does looking forward. Or maybe there are things unresolved in our past that is keeping us from keeping our hands to that plow and looking forward. So today, we'll move on to this third part and the most important part of understanding discipleship. And as you see in the bulletin, we will turn our attention to the teaching of disciples. We will spend a great deal of time in this book of Matthew as we uh, break down the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in chapter 5, verse 1 through chapter 7, verse 29. But before we begin to break that down, let's first look at an overview of the events uh, leading up to the sermon. In this overview, we will look at material that many of the confirmation kids will be like, oh, I've been there. Uh, we've been going through it over the past 12, le- 12 weeks or so. But let's begin with Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Where at age 30, Jesus identified as God's Son, as He is baptized in the water by John. You know, the John who was born to Elizabeth, who was too old to have children, who was to, as Isaiah wrote, or John who was to, as Isaiah wrote, make ready the way of the Lord. And after his one water baptism, the Holy Spirit of God descended from heaven and came upon Jesus and led Jesus straight to the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. He did this so Satan could tempt him. And by facing temptation, Jesus identified with us as we face temptations every single day. None like he faced so. Remember how Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and this is what I'm talking about. I've never fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I can't imagine what that would be like and the hunger you would have, even though I might be able to use a 40-day fast. Um, but back, back to business. All right. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and in his hunger, Satan tested him. He tested his human weakness three times as he pounced on this chance like a lion pouncing on the opportunity to kill his prey. You know, in the first test, Satan tried to get Jesus to work a divine miracle in order to suit the will of his flesh. Satan tells Jesus to turn a simple stone into bread. And Jesus, in response, rebuked Satan with Scripture as he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, word for word. Jesus, despite his hunger of his flesh, says, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And in the third test, we'll skip the second one for time's sake. Satan showed, you know, Satan brought Jesus up to this mountainside and, and showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of earth in their glory and said, All of these things I will give to you if you just fall down and worship me. And in this test, Satan was basically saying, why don't you take the easy way out? Why don't you take the easy way out? Why go through the trouble of choosing and training up disciples? Why go through the chain, the pain, and the suffering of dying for the sin on the cross? Why do that to accomplish God's will when I can just give it to you? And in response, Christ, uh, Christ first tells Satan to go and to flee, and then Jesus refers to Deuteronomy 613, he didn't quote it word for word. He said, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. And you know, Jesus knew that He alone would bring in the kingdom of God and He he alone would be king of that heavenly kingdom. And after Jesus overcame the temptation in the wilderness, He was empowered by God and ready to hit the ground running. This is our New Testament scripture reading states in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 5. Jesus instantly begins the ministry that God the Father has given him. And with full authority, Jesus begins to call ordinary people to repent. Because the kingdom, because the king is among them, which means that the kingdom of heaven is near. With full authority, Jesus also begins to call ordinary people to follow him as disciples. With full authority, Jesus begins to reveal the kingdom of God through enacting miracles as Jesus restores the sick to health and restores the deaf to hearing and the blind to see and the crippled to rise and walk for the very first time. With full authority, Jesus begins to teach disciples as He injects Christ-like character in His disciples and would-be disciples. And large crowds gather because of all of this authority that's visible. 
And this leads us to the Sermon on the Mount. And I hope you can see by what we've been going through, this is going to be a lead-in sermon. We're not jumping right in. So now the Sermon on the Mount happens to be the greatest sermon ever preached, the most beloved sermon ever preached, the most frequently referred to sermon ever preached, the most important, the most influential sermon ever preached. And this sermon is timeless, and its impact is felt by all people, no matter how young or old they are, no matter if they're female or male, and it especially does not matter if they're a believer or an unbeliever. Unbeliever, sorry. Many of us in this room remember hearing parts of the sermon as children, and most of us remember hearing it in church, or maybe in Sunday school, or at a vacation Bible school. But some of us remember a time when we were taught parts of the sermon in grade school, whether we went to a private Lutheran school, or a private Christian school, or maybe even in the public school. Others may remember hearing parts of the sermon from their believing parents or non-believing parents, and this is exactly where I heard a part of the Sermon of the Mount for the first time. As a kid, I remember my non-believing mother beating the golden rule into me. Oh my gosh, she didn't use a paddle. She used the golden rule. I'm telling you, I'm very thankful for her because she did this because she experienced so much poor treatment in life and knowing that she could do nothing about that poor treatment that was given to her, she made sure to instill it in me. She made sure that I would treat all others the same way that I wish to be treated by them. Now, do I do that every day? Yeah, I'd be standing here as someone else if I did. But I'm very thankful for her, do, for her doing that. You know, at the time when she was doing this, we just knew it as the golden rule. Because neither my mom nor I knew that this rule came from the perfect Word of God in the book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. And just like this example, I'll share another one with you. Gandhi, a Hindu, reportedly spent two hours each day in meditation over the course of 40 years. Gosh, that's a lot of time. You know, most of the time in meditation was spent reading the Sermon on the Mount. And because of this influence, Gandhi actually professed to be a Christian Muslim Hindu Jew. I don't know how that's possible, but I'm guessing it links to be good people and to not do violence unto others, my guess. So isn't it, and you know, because of this influence, he went on the record saying, isn't it more important that we do what Jesus wants us to do than to call him Lord, Lord? And you know what? If you just read that quote, you can say, no, professing Christ is the important part, and then doing what he says. But from his perspective, shouldn't our actions speak for us? We shouldn't have to say, Lord, Lord. They should know that Christ is our Lord by our actions. So this quote, although correct in one sense and incorrect in another, gives us the other side of the coin to the sermon. The sermon is the most understood sermon ever preached, and I want us to understand that. It's the most misunderstood, the most misquoted sermon ever preached. And because of this, there are 36 documented interpretations of this sermon. 36 different viewpoints that are documented. Now that makes me think, how many are out there that aren't? Okay? So that pushes that number way up there. And with all this in mind, I will humbly try to teach the sermon to you. I hope you understand that I need your prayers in this. So I'm going to ask for that number one. Because... This is the greatest sermon ever given by the greatest teacher, but not just teacher, Lord, ever given. Please know that Christ Jesus is the only one qualified to break down this teaching. So, again, pray for me, and I'll pray for the Holy Spirit to reveal the meaning to everyone in this room. So with all of this information in mind, let's look at the sermon from one of these 36 viewpoints. And the viewpoint that we will be diving through the sermon in is the teaching of disciples. And although some believe that this sermon deals specifically with the presentation of the gospel message and the response to it, I feel the purpose of this sermon is to deal with the character and conduct of those who have experienced that spiritual change and belong to God. 
Can parts of the sermon convict a non-believer of their sinful nature? Maybe. <laughs> but most non-believers read this sermon with the hopes that these words of Jesus will condone their sinful behavior. I can raise my hands, I don't know how many times, going into that scripture, hoping that it would justify the sin that, that I was in. And you know what? I can even give you another example. When I denied God and denied the perfect word, I hoped that this sermon would give me the ammo that I needed to have against my dad for the sins that he committed to me in the past. And you know, when one reads it in that lens, I guarantee you that you will find exactly what you need to hold it against a Christian. Why? Because of its perfect standard. God, none of us in this room live by that standard, do we? I hope I don't see anyone faking yes. Because it's a perfect standard. You know, if we think we can achieve perfection here on earth, we will fail often and eventually give up. But we must realize that the impossible ethical standards that Christ Jesus gives to his disciples are not meant to discourage us into giving up or discourage us into simply resting comfortably as heirs to the kingdom of God. Instead, disciples must see these impossible ethical standards as a gift from God through the grace and mercy that He alone bestows on us. And you know, this gift that God has bestowed from above comes in the form of two things. Number one, the divine revelation of God, who God is, and how He alone restores those who respond to the Gospel. Let me reread it. The first blessing that God gives, the divine revelation of God of who God is and how He restores those who respond to the Gospel. And only by understanding the truth of what God is will we ever find out who we are truly meant to be in Him. Number two, Christ's perfect example of kingdom living will constantly dig down in our deepest parts in order to reveal our weaknesses and our imperfections and especially our sins. This gift from God is a blessing to the disciple, even though we may not think so. <laughs> even though it hurts. And as we see, it's a blessing as we see repentance is not a one-and-done deal. Instead, we see repentance as a lifelong spiritual discipline. And this will help us to not be discouraged when we fall, but instead to see our failures and imperfections as a means of being sanctified or perfected by the Holy Spirit within us. This powerful sermon that Christ gave to all disciples and would-be disciples shows them that no matter how far down that Christian road a disciple actually is, or they may think they are, there is always work to be done. This means that all disciples who are not Jesus have much work to do in this department. And this should help to keep us not, to not be comfortable. But instead, to be heirs to the kingdom that visibly shows signs of the kingdom living while they are here on the earth. By doing this, we disciples can help clear the air of confusion, as I, as I spoke about I don't know how many times in the past year. That air of confusion of what a Christian is defined as in this world today. You know, we can visibly put Christ first by living a life filtered through the perfect example of Christ, or we can place Christ last by living a life filtered through the ethical standards of this world. You know, question, do we... Do we know the difference between the ethical standards of Christ and that perfect example? Or do we, in comparison to the ethical standards of the world, do we know? Are we living a life that honors God? And are we living a lot, or are we living a life that honors others or honors ourselves? You know what? If we don't know the answers to these questions, I promise you, by the time we're done, <laughs> with the greatest sermon ever preached, that we will. Um, it'll reveal through you, I promise. Next week, we will begin the teaching of disciples. We'll begin this portion as we dive right into the blessings or joys of the kingdom of God. We will have no choice but to see these blessings or joys are only visible in those who are restored by God. 
I will promise a few things about this sermon, and then we'll close. We will see glimpses of the kingdom of heaven, which are both here now on earth and to come when Christ um, comes to complete it. We will see Christ's perfect example of kingdom living compared to the world's example of living. And lastly, we will see God for the truth of who He is, rather than seeing Him in the lies that this world shovels to all who are willing to hear. So I ask again, please pray, not only for me to understand the truth as I prepare sermons on this beloved scripture, but pray for this body and ask for God to give us His truth alone, His understanding alone. Pray that Jesus will deconstruct our lives during this sermon. Not this one, but the Sermon on the Mount. The sermon on the Mount. Pray that Jesus will deconstruct our lives in order to build us back up with His righteousness alone. And pray for the Holy Spirit to equip us that we can live kingdom lives in a fallen and dark world. So, I have a challenge for each and every one in here. And those of your friends who are missing, you, it's your job to give them the challenge. Because <laughs> I may not see them. I'm going to ask each and every one in here, and all those who are a part of this body, uh, whether they... Uh, come in here or listen to the sermons online. I want us to read this beloved sermon. Read chapter 5, verse 1 through chapter 7, verse 29, as we are spending time in this beloved sermon. Because I can tell you, there's so much harshness in this from the, from the mouth of Jesus that it will cut through you. And the beauty of it is that if you're reading it yourself, the initial shock is on your time. And then the second blow will come when we get there. All right? So please read this. So in order to help get us kick-started, I'll read the first two verses. All right? I do my part. All right? I do my part for all of you here. Now when he saw the crowd, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, And the rest is up to you. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your perfect teaching, your perfect sermon, the sermon that instructs disciples and would-be disciples how to seek you, how to desire a life that is a reflection of yours while we are here, Lord. And even though we will fail every moment of every day trying to seek the perfection that you bring, Lord, bring us joy, bring us blessings in that suffering. Lord, it is my prayer that each and every heart is convicted by this sermon. In one way or another, that we can grow by the conviction of the Holy Spirit to become more like you over the course of the next month and time to come. Lord, we lift this prayer up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to do things a little different. We're going to have the closing song first, and then we'll um, do the Lord's table.